Does everybody know my name? You know who I am? What's my name? What's my name? You got the correct answer. Now scream it louder. What's my name? I think the people in the audience just wrote a hit song. You gotta keep clapping really, really loud and really, really long during the Dango Jones show. You wanna know why? Because I'm insecure and I have self-esteem and self-respect issues. You must validate my existence. Make me feel good about myself tonight. I honestly don't believe to this day we're a successful band. I walk on stage every night, I do every tour thinking that I don't know if this is just gonna fall apart. I have no idea. It is my duty to make sure that everybody in this club has a good time. This is the line. This is my house, and that's my front porch. So if you're knocking on my door, welcome. It doesn't feel like a job, what we're doing. No, but it is a job. This is where I work. You want to see where I work? Check it out. We take it seriously, like it is a job, but a at the same time- A lot of people have a negative connotation when it comes to the word job and what that means. But when I use the word job, I think it's a positive thing because I like my job. I love it when it goes like Who the fuck doesn't want to be in a rock band. I'm not asking you to bust your ass for the company and then we can sell, you know, all these chairs. No, so we can go all over the world, play as many rock shows and meet as many people and play with as many cool bands and maybe have enough money to pay the rent so you can keep going and do it not selling chairs or shoes, doing, doing it playing rock. We came to rock the rock and rollers. We have come with our brand of rock and roll. We wanted to do the kind of stuff that we grew up listening to, like Kiss and ACDC and Lizzie. As much as we acknowledged and we respected and we loved like bands like the Gories and the Dirt Bombs and the Oblivions and stuff, I think we had just grown out of it. You know, I don't know if growing out of it is the right term, but whether you listen to Kiss or whether you listen to the Gories, it's still called rock and roll. There's still rock and roll bands, both of them. And we wanted to do the Kiss kind. I want to rock and roll all night and rock and roll every day. The first band that really got me was Kiss. Like Danko, one of the first bands I got into was Kiss as well. And I was five and I asked my mom to buy me a record and it was a Kiss record. When I was six years old, I bugged my mom to buy a Kiss album and she finally relented. So we went to the Music World store in Fairview Mall and I chose the thickest one I could find because it had the most stuff included for free inside, like a booklet, and, and it was a gatefold out. And that was Kiss Alive. It was always kind of like a big affair when you get the vinyl and you would follow along with the lyrics and look at the pictures and get a whole different idea of what the band was that you were listening to. A lot of the attraction about Kiss was that they were these superhumans, and I was into comic books, just like every other kid my age at the time, except I think I took it a little bit further because I identified with Kiss in a way that maybe some other kids didn't. I was an only child and I wanted a brother or a sister and I pretended that they were my older brothers and they wore makeup so you couldn't really see their, the skin color. You know, you kind of get immersed into this imaginary world, so ever since I was a kid, I was always kind of lost in that. I used to just listen to the album over and over again to the point where my parents started getting worried and my, my dad eventually broke it over his knee. And that really made me want it even more. The images will be embedded into my psyche till I'm dead. And it took me a long time to really take any band who wasn't wearing any kind of makeup seriously. Because from there, I moved on to Motley Crue because they were like the new Kiss and they wore makeup a little bit. I was living in Canada first and I moved to Italy like when I was 10. 
there was no real record store, so it was all by mail order. So you'd get these catalogs of records, and you just have to order stuff. While MTV was at its height, while Much Music was at, was at its height, I was still grappling with images on paper. There was still just photos of the Bad Brains. But they're Rastafarian guys. Shouldn't they be playing like reggae? No, they play this intense, crazy punk rock stuff. What? I kind of got more into bands like Iron Maiden and The Clash, and then got into stuff like Metallica. So that shaped me into what kind of music I liked. And then I started playing the bass because my brother played the guitar, and my mom got us some instruments. We're just always playing around at the house. I was six years old. I wanted to play drums, and my mom wanted me to learn piano and I just did not have the attention span to play piano. So she compromised with guitar. My first guitar that I got when I was six years old, you can see there's three strings. The rest of them are here, very rusted out. The strings hurt my fingers, so I stopped lessons, and I didn't pick it up until I was 13 again. Oh, shit, these are from my very first guitar lessons. Um, wow, this is wild. This is... Hey Joe, when I actually learned it, kind of, I'm still learning it, finger picking variations. You know, just doing everything from playing along with like Beastie Boys and trying to play Iron Maiden songs, trying to play Metallica stuff. I haven't opened this up since I think I put it away all those years ago. There's all my loving Beatles. There we go. As you can tell, I didn't have enough money to actually buy the magazines, so I'd go to the library and photocopy them. Oh, great. Did you? It's got some stairway, stairway to heaven <laughs> guitar tab. This is where it all starts, man. And then I got an electric guitar, like a Squire, for Christmas. And I wanted a black guitar, and they didn't have that. But I didn't want to go home without a guitar, so I ended up going home with a baby blue Squire guitar that I didn't really want. I saw this just now my guitar case from high school. So you saw the one when I was six years old, but this is the one from high school. You can tell it's high school because it's got a Misfit sticker and a Bad Brain sticker. And they're pretty good stickers because they're still on the case, like after all these years. It's funny to have all this stuff. Yeah. That's the one I had from high school. One, two, three, four! Still JC! Still DJ! Still the Mango Kid! Still rocking a stage, still the dynamic duo, still the Glimmer Twins, still keeping it rock solid. Being in a band is, is like being in a marriage, you know? Some marriages last for six months, <clears throat> some last for a week, and some last for years and years and years. Well, it's been almost 15, 16 years now that we've been together, and the reason why we've been together, I think it's just the dynamic works great between the two of us, and we both trust each other. We were both very hungry when we first started this band. We both were willing to do whatever it takes. We're pretty much like brothers at this point. We spend so much time together, and uh, he's my best friend. We know the commitment to each other is there, so it's just a matter of keeping the train on the tracks. And there's been some people that we've wanted included in on the train, and they just weren't biting, and they didn't, weren't weren't very interested in it. So it's just been him and I all this time. We've both proven it to each other that we're willing to work very, very hard to achieve a common goal. Hey, JC, do we gotta prove ourselves all over again? I don't think so. I think we just gotta put on a good rock show for everybody right here, right now. <laughs> How I met JC was through college radio. Danko went to university and he studied film. I'm the fucking director now. I want one camera on the audience. I want you to go fucking ape shit. One, two, three. Yeah. I went to university for environmental studies. It makes sense. Film and environmental studies, Danko Jones. <laughs> <laughs> you know who that is? That's my number one fan right there. Let me get back at you. That's my number one Daniel Jones fan. He's been to every show. We used to hang out on campus at York University and at CHRY, the radio station that was at York University and still is there. But I ended up having a show there, and I did a show for four or five years. Danko's show was called The Seminal Load, and it was on Sunday nights. I think it was 11 to 2. So I would actually go down and hang out. And I mean, he'd play anything from Girls Against Boys to Jesus Lizard to 
John Zorn and like really obscure stuff. It's just kind of like an open platform. That's kind of the beauty of radio and college radio setting that you can pretty much do whatever you want. When I was doing the show, I would just take out records and play it over the air just to hear it. Now I could say, I went to university to find out about music. And from that radio station, you meet people in the scene and et cetera, et cetera. I met this person, that person. I started to play in bands. Greetings. Greetings. We're the Dapper Dan Trio. Him and his friend Paul and were in a band called the Dapper Dan Trio. We had nothing going on and we were so bored and we weren't getting laid. And so I just go to his parents' basement and he had a four track and we just record these insane songs and we just listen to Ween all the time. Minus the glue, we were like Ween. He was fronting the band as Dapper Dan, and the whole song was kind of like a Las Vegas show tune where he would just say his name, hello, I'm Dapper Dan, good evening, welcome to the evening, and he just kept saying that over and over, and I thought it was hilarious. And then we really wanted to get serious. We thought, okay, forget this joke crap. Let's like seriously do a band. The Dapper Dan trio was pretty short-lived, and then after that, Horshack came about. Horshack was a three-piece band fashioned after Jesus Lizard and Mule and Flight Camp and all that kind of touch-and-go type 90s stuff. <laughs> I was in a band called Cat Rocket, and Danko was in uh, Horshack, and then we'd play shows together. Some of them were actually CHRY benefit gigs for the radio station. He played bass, I played bass. I'd always borrow his amp, because I never had an amp. Paul Zeraldo was playing guitar, and then Josh Rossett was playing drums. Later on, Josh and myself actually ended up playing in Cat Rocket. Paul and Danko form the Violent Brothers. Danko played drums and alternated playing guitar, and I would have to say I really preferred him over Paul playing the drums. He was really doing all the poses. And he could keep the beat, which was real simple, and he was a pretty good drummer. The attention that he demanded on the stage was really the one thing that always struck me more than anything. He was just a really charismatic frontman, and you kind of didn't see that that often. The Violent Brothers shows really kind of exploded for me. I started to wear whatever it is that I wanted to wear. We talk about a lot of sex. Doing all this crazy stuff and saying anything that I wanted to say in the name of rock and roll. Tonight. do in clubs before at like people that I, I thought were like doing this and doing that. And on stage, I would just say it to their face. You pool shocks over there. Hey, pool shocks. You got a couple of Moby Dicks right here. We're going to capsize your ass if you don't come over here and stop that. And I got laughs and applause and people liked it. <laughs> The Violent Brothers' stay was very short. We played like maybe a dozen gigs. When that band kind of fell apart, I had left Cat Rocket. And it's just the same old story in every scene in every city is like, you know, bands form, they meet each other, they network, and they break up and they form new bands with the ex-members. And until something, you know, cracks, something breaks, something happens. Danko told me that he knew a drummer. His name was Michael, and he was working at two local record stores. 1996. Danko Jones was formed, Michael Carey Carey on drums, JC on bass guitar, and I'm singing and playing guitar. This is Danko motherfucking Jones. At first, I think he wanted to call it Danko Jones and the Impossible Dream, but then uh, I think Michael was a suggestion, why don't you just call it Danko Jones? It's just too long. So he's like, yeah, that's good. When we started gigging, it was easy kind of to spread the word about this thing we were doing because of the Violent Brothers and what had happened in the short time that the Violent Brothers were around. Violent Brothers kind of paved the way for what Danko Jones became. 
It's a packed house at Ted's Wrecking Yard tonight. We got on these great gigs right away. The word spread about our band very quickly. And one of those shows was our first Toronto show, opening up for the New Bomb Turks. And at the time, the New Bomb Turks had just signed to Epitaph. Epitaph was this new, burgeoning, biggest punk rock label because of the Offspring Smash album. And they had all this money, and the New Bomb Turks were a new signing. And so there was a lot of hype coming into this New Bomb Turks show. Here is this band that we looked up to, and then next thing you know, we're opening up for them, and they liked it. Eric Davidson, the singer of the New Bomb Turks, saw our set that night, and he invited me up on stage with them. That was almost like a knighting from someone from out of town who knighted us as a band to look out for. And after that, the New Bomb Turks kind of took us under their wing. New Bomb Turks are up after this song. With that go Jones, we came to rock your motherfucking ass, and I hope we did. Because baby, yeah. Dr. Evening is in the house tonight. When we started out, we were pretty arrogant. I'm sick and tired of going to these motherfucking rock shows and everybody stands there with a fucking glass in their hand and a smoke, and that's all they fucking do. Stand around and fucking look at everybody else. Mainly because I thought that was the way to get noticed. I'm staring right at you, and all of you motherfuckers are just standing there looking to rip your ass off. You know why? It was fun to piss people off. And I always have this in the back of my head, especially when it comes to the music industry, is they love it when you tell them to fuck off. It's kind of like a pretty girl who doesn't get the attention of the one guy that intrigues her. If there's any record company people, don't bother coming up to us after the show. We started to tell everyone in the scene and eventually people in the media that we weren't gonna put out a record. And that did intrigue people. Rock and roll messiah, devil child, the sexiest alter ego in town. Those are some pretty heavy titles that have been bestowed upon you by the media. Do you feel the least bit pressured by any of those titles? No. We want to be known as a live band. We want people to come to us. It says in the bio of the guy that you're, uh, that you're an independent act. Do you, have, um, do you have something out there people can buy? No. Nothing yet? Back in the day, we did do recordings. We just never released anything. We had a cassette, and we'd give them to certain bookers and certain bands, and we just never put it out. We just kind of figured, hey, if other bands like our band, we'll just be able to play with them. And we did full tours without any merchandise or anything to sell. And this is pre-internet times. Because now to think about it, I mean, it would not be possible to do this now. There's bands who come out with a demo and an EP or something before like their second show. We went on without merch or CD for way too long. Probably a good <laughs> three years, four years. And it was doing those tours where we had to dig into our own pockets for gas money and we weren't making any money and we had already taken time off our day jobs to do this, so we were really burning it at both ends, that we really thought, okay, well, why don't we put out an EP? We've gotten some, some feedback from some labels where people thought we were sexist. Because I sung about women a lot in, in the songs. <laughs> But it wasn't gangster rap put to garage rock. I don't speak of sex in a, in a vulgar way. I don't assume, I, you know, when I speak about a woman, it's usually about a woman that I'm with or that I want to be with, not that I've had. People can comb through our lyrics to this day and there's nothing that I consider sexist, more so than any kind of, you know, Otis Redding or Sam Cooke song or Outkast. Okay, so there's some outcast lyrics that are kind of sexist, but whatever. You know, not Miss Jackson. Not that our songs are like um, Miss Jackson. It just kind of brings you back to that line from Spinal Tap, what's wrong with being sexy? I guess a lot is wrong with being sexy. If you want to kiss me, I gotta say, 
I'm taking girls. I'm going out with someone, and her name is my career. My favorite label at the time was Touch and Go. Had all my favorite bands on there. We played with a lot of Touch and Go bands and people in other bands like us. But then when we get to like people who run labels and work at labels, we just never appeal to them. Everyone from like Get Hip, Matador, In the Red, rejection after rejection. We weren't wanted by any of them. I think we may have scared off a bunch of people because of our knowledge <laughs> of, of the fact of wanting to own our publishing and wanting to own our, own our masters. And when you notice in the industry, they sign bands and they work with bands that you'd never heard of before because these are these hungry bands that are willing to give everything away. We were a little more hardened, schooled. It was self-imposed because we were arrogant in the beginning and we did this on our own. We wanted to do distribution deals or, or stuff that wouldn't bind us with somebody indefinitely. So we went to a label that was in Hamilton, an hour away from Toronto, called Sonic Onion. And they were ready to be the label to put out the first thing by this band that had told everyone to fuck off. Um, we've got CDs for sale. We were very protective of our band. We didn't want it soiled by anything. We put limitations on everything that they could do. You know, 500 copies of the seven inch. That just came in a white sleeve and it was numbered one to 500. And then 2,000 copies of the EP. Sugar Chocolate was on that and that was kind of the anchor song. Now if you want your chocolate with your sugar, you can call it cocoa butter or you can call it white chocolate. But baby, I just call it delicious. It did pretty well. It got us a lot of attention. We were able to do a few cross-Canada tours and hit the U.S. a few times. GAC booked this tour in the States that we did for a month. I ended up doing a lot of the booking for the band. I did take on the role as the manager. And I remember I was really happy when I got a fax machine. I didn't have a cell phone. We didn't have cell phones. We'd have to, like, you know, find a payphone or check your voicemail at home. It was usually a cassette tape that would run out by the time you finish a tour. I think it was the first date in Chicago that we sold out of all the merchandise. Thank you, Chicago music scene. From Chicago, we drove down to San Diego, so right across the U.S. By the time we got to San Diego, after driving in the desert in our really old van, we had to buy new tires. The tires had melted. I still remember it. It was pretty harsh. It wasn't the most glamorous tour. If uh, any band would do it, I think that the breakup would have been imminent in the middle of the tour. Not even, they wouldn't even wait till the end of the tour. There was no back seat in our van. There was a couple nights, me and JC slept on the cabinets. We put these two amps together. There was only two seats in the front. So those two amps were there and we had sort of like a blanket futon that we'd run on top of it. And that was the back seat. Yeah, these were back seats. These were the headrests, right? Yeah, the headrests. And a few <clears throat> times it happens where you had to break abruptly and everything yeah. would kind of come up really front. It wasn't a very smart thing to do. It shows that we did back then, you never just never know what you'd get. You get 50 bucks, you get enough for a tank of gas, you'd be happy. You get enough for a tank of gas and some meal. Whoa. It was good to do. I think every band should do that for, for a couple of years. It'll shut them up. And like I said, we were pretty arrogant when we started. And it was tours like that that really shut me up. <laughs> Towards the end of the year, we felt that there was a need to change the lineup. Things with Michael weren't working out. He wanted to speed up all the songs, a la Zeke or whatever. You know, make, make the songs real fast, a la The Dwarves. <laughs> and we didn't want to do that. We wanted to kind of slow it down, put in a chorus, maybe a bridge. I didn't know how to do that. JC was more advanced with that. In terms of song arrangement, sometimes I kind of would offer my two cents as to how to put stuff together. And to this day, Danko's just like a riff machine. You can be in a room with him and he just sometimes doesn't even know how good he is. So it's just a matter of maybe going, hey, maybe do these three parts like this. I was still at the point where it's like, well, it sounds like Kiss, great. What a great riff. I just wrote the runner. I wrote, I wrote that right now. I wrote that too. This is the 
This is creativity in action right now. I just wanted the riff to be cool and like, I'm gonna say this melody part and it's kind of catchy. That's how I still treat songs. <laughs> on the show. We're gonna write a fucking song right now. That simple way and that kind of childlike way is, I think, the nub of what gets everybody. I don't remember the intricacies of my favorite song, but I do remember the chorus, or I can remember that guitar riff. <laughs> When we started to slow down our sound and we wanted to graduate from being just an, another garage rock band to being a rock band, we got Gavin Brown to drum for us. Mr. Golden Brown, Mr. Golden Nugget, Mr. Triple Chip, Mr. Hot Kicks, Mr. Sausage, Mr. Gap Model. Gavin Brown is a um, man about the scene. He was in a band called Flag Camp in Toronto, and then in the 90s, they were a really, really big underground band. A lot of people loved them. After Flag Camp split, Gavin ended up playing in several bands in Canada, one of them being Big Sugar. Danko Jones would open for Big Sugar, so we would always see Gavin, and we always noticed that he kind of had a style that would be great for our band. We were really big fans of his drumming. He wasn't happy with Big Sugar, and he made the split, and he decided to slum it with us. In 1999, we put out an EP called My Love is Bold. That EP shot up to number one on the college campus charts. It went neck and neck for weeks with Beck. One week we would be number one and Beck would be number two. And then the next week we would be number two and Beck would be number one. And we were number one for a long time. Toronto's Denko Jones is considered by many to be the next big thing. And they're certainly getting a great deal of airplay these days on the radio. Well, they just shot their very first video for their latest album called my love is bold. I love your I love your thigh high boots, your snake skin one piece suit. Bounce got played on college radio, it was on mainstream radio, it was on much music, the MTV of Canada, and it was unbelievable. And uh, Gavin then we, 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 yeah, and then we kicked out Gavin. Right when it got added, I think. Gavin kind of had his ideas of becoming a producer, and a lot of his ideas and where he wanted to go really didn't fit in with the aesthetic and style of what Danko Jones is. Same old artistic differences reared its ugly head. And so if you go back and you look at the video for Bounce, Gavin isn't in the video. But we had these shows booked, and we had to get them done. And our booking agent at the time, Nico Quintal, was a drummer, and he drummed for a Conline Crush. He's the drummer in the video, and he really helped us out when we were in a bind. Bought us some time to find a drummer, and we had known of this guy, Damon Richardson. He was a really good rock drummer with a good sense of style. It was kind of frantic, almost about to fall apart, but keeping it together, a solid rock drummer. He drummed for Change of Heart, which was a really well-known indie rock band in Canada. You know, we had this tour booked with Sloan, this indie rock Canadian band. Our first show with Damon was the first show of the tour with Sloan. <laughs> Mr. Damon Richardson on drums. The DR, the doctor, rocket scientist himself. You know, Damon put the DR in drums. Between you and the drum kit, what do you think of Danko Jones? Um, I was pretty drunk when they played. What can I say? Can I? <laughs> they rock. My mama made me for one thing. Get up on a stage and sing. I didn't get my phone to rock in the spot. You wanna rock, you gotta rock shit. I 
the best live band, basically, that there is, like, in the world, basically. He's fantastic. Great total performer, like, awesome songs that sound great live. Excellent showman, which is missing sorely from so many bands. People know our name now in the music scene across Canada. They're going to be on every front page of every newspaper in the world. I'm going to... Riding this wave, and Damon got on board. The shows were going great. We were getting along really well off stage as well, which is really the most important thing. We wanted to solidify this as this three piece that it needed to be. That was our hope at that time, that this was the lineup. Probably zigzagged across Canada three times. Up until you do that drive Vancouver to Toronto, you're not really a band. You gotta do that drive, and it takes forever. We did it without any iPads or iPhones back in the day, watching the highway lines go by, and that's it. JC! Jalen! Let's tear the roof down! <laughs> When we come back from these tours, I'd go back and work at a coffee store where I would open up at six in the morning and work till two. So I would get up every day at five when I wasn't touring and do that in order to tour and subsidize with the touring. I was working at a <clears throat> porno shop at the time. There's this guy in this punk rock band called Trigger Happy. I've known Al Nolan for several years. He was actually in a band called Deep End and my cousin played in that band. Then Al started a band called Trigger Happy, and Trigger Happy got released by Bad Taste Records, based out of Lund in Sweden. Al came to the porno shop, and we met, and he talked about this label in Europe. He's going to try and sell them on our band. And they got in touch with us in, I believe it was in 2000, shortly thereafter. They're like, OK, well, let's just try and see if this works with one release and see if we can work together. And we want to take you over to Europe and do a tour. I love the fact that they were interested only because of the music and not the live show, which was the complete opposite of what we originally wanted people to be into. Partly because maybe I was feeling a little insecure about the music. I didn't think the music could stand on its own if you were to just listen to it. And here were these guys in, in Sweden who just liked the music, were interested in putting out the music. They hadn't even seen the band yet. So. We said yes, and they brought us over for this skid introduction to Europe tour. We got a CD out. It's called I'm Alive and on Fire. We're on a label out of Sweden called Bad Taste. I'm Alive and on Fire. It was a compilation of B-sides and rare tracks, and this was the first time us as a band were leaving North American shores to a new land. So me, JC, Damon, and our sound man, Corey, got on a plane and went to Europe. Corey started working with us probably in 98, 99. In July 1998, I was mixing Nashville Pussy, and Danko Jones was supporting them, and I uh, gave him my card. And his card was a get-out-of-jail-free card that you get in Monopoly. So I'm like, I got to call this guy. This is the best card I got ever. <laughs> they phone me, and they keep phoning me. He was the guy that we felt comfortable with, was the sound guy. And then at the same time, we're just getting to the point where we could afford crew. Do you remember the plane ride to Amsterdam on that first European tour? The Hells Angels. The Hells Angels. Um, we're on the plane. And you're like, I know that guy. When I started doing this, I used to do biker cabarets. Yeah, man. Uh, but I didn't know this back history. And you just stood up, and you're like, hey, how's it going? Hey, I'm from Saskatoon. You know, I'm like, I just don't want a bullet hole in, in, the, in the plane. Oh, I was totally fine. That was, hey, I didn't know. I was fucking pretty wet behind the ear back in 2001, <laughs> especially traveling across the Atlantic. But the funniest thing is when we got all the way from Toronto to Amsterdam to drive to Sweden and stop in Germany to buy beer. We got booze for the Swedes. We're going to Scandinavia, thank God. It's not that Germany's bad, Germany's good. We want these, uh, the Scandinavia is where we're from. What? We're from Scandinavia. We're a Swedish man. Remember with that uh, ticket to the show, you got two free beers. That, that was because of us and our beer yeah. run. So a lot so of that beer. So we brought beer, people with beer. That's how. A lot of that beer was kind of like the gear. And you know, we, ever since that's what we've been doing in Sweden now, we've usually stopped in Germany, bring beer, and if you come to Sudanko, you got five beer. Beer's expensive. <laughs> How's everybody doing tonight? You know, we might 
might be from Canada, but this band was made in Sweden. And more specifically, this band is made from Lund, Sweden. That's right. Lund, Sweden, the home of our record label, were putting on a show in the club in the city, and we met with all the Bad Taste guys. This is a Bad Taste, this is massive. Yeah. As you can see, everyone's very exciting here. All kinds of craziness happens. Bjorn and Jonas, these are the heads of Bad Taste Records. And I remember having a very good impression of them. And just the way they did business and the way they handled themselves, how they carried themselves, was much akin to how we did business and how we treated people. You just roll up your sleeves and get to work. And there's no excuse not doing anything because you can do it. And that's the kind of attitude that we've always had. And we were lucky enough to find like-minded people to work together with. And I just remember thinking, these people are putting out a record. They like the music. They've never even seen their band. We're going to blow them fucking away. I just wanted to get off stage and have their jaws drop. I get so excited. God damn, I need a sex chain. And I think we did that. Everybody's gonna have a goddamn time. Our third gig was in Malmo, Sweden, and that day a bunch of things kind of lined up for us that set the stage for the future. Malmo! Look at Shut up! We played with the Backyard Babies that day, and Dragon, the guitar player in the band who co-founded the Helicopters, he loved our band. On the strength of playing with them that day, asked us to go on tour with them later that year in 2001 for their European club tour. We got to play in front of packed houses almost every night. Which would have taken us years to play in front of on our own. In the crowd on that third show, was the assistant of our European booking agent, who's our, still our agent to this day, Toby Lawrence's assistant, Hans. He held cell phone up as we played for Toby to hear. And Toby just said, okay, I'm gonna sign you. I've never signed any band that I haven't seen, but I'm signing you guys to our roster. So we got a booking agent out of that show. And then I met my wife. I had met my wife just hours before that show. And so those 24 hours, I think, changed my life because it took us across Europe. We played in front of hundreds, sometimes a couple thousand people a night. And I think we won the crowds over every night. Now there was a buzz going. Everyone was like, who is that band? GC, Damon Richardson, Daniel Jones, Corey Shields. Please and gentlemen, the Hives are up next. We played the Oya Festival in Oslo with the Hives. We did Ross Gilder Festival. We did the Hultsford Festival. How's about we get down and dirty and we rip this place apart? After the first few tours of Europe, we definitely were eager to get a proper record out and keep touring because I think we just had the biggest rush of our lives by playing those festivals and shows. We were working these certain songs forever and they made up, I'd say, half of what became Born a Lion, which was our first full-length official album. We got an album called Born a Lion. It's got a song on it called Lover Call. That song's got a bass line on it, played by Mr. JC. Songs like Sound of Love and Play the Blues and Lover Call and Love is Unkind, these were songs that had been hanging around us for a couple of years at that point. I might not be the sharpest dresser in the room. I might not know how to look a girl in the eye. I might not have the right pickup lines. But I'll show you what I got. The 
Bubba Call, baby. You wanna do it, do it right. Up and down, side to side. Baby, we could do it for a night. We only had about six or seven of those songs, so we needed to write more. So that's what we did. We wrote songs like Papa after our first European tour, Word is Bond, we wrote coming into the sessions. We had always wanted to work with somebody who is compatible with us in the studio. We don't know what we're doing in the studio. I don't know how to mic a drum kit. We need a producer. We need a third or fourth set of ears. So on our first record, we decided to work with Bill Bell as our producer, and then we hired Matt DiMatteo as our engineer. I was managing the studio, doing all the sessions, doing my own productions, playing in bands. We had a great time. You know, they knocked my socks off. They played the songs Lickety Split, and the band was just heavy. I mean, I, I, I love the punk elements of, of Danko Jones. I also like the blues elements. If we introduced ourselves with I'm Alive and On Fire, Born Alive established us as a rock band that isn't just a kind of a fly-by-night thing. We're here. And I think Born Line did that. It was our first full-length album, and for me it was like, wow, we finally put out a record, like a full-length, the, the same thing that I buy from other people, you know? Like, that's how I felt when we put out Born Lion. Check it out. Yeah, it's him. Yeah, it's him. <laughs> what the hell? Really? Look at that. Nice, snake killer. Yeah. Snake killer. Bra. 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 Mycket bra. Mycket bra. Tack. I don't think they believe you, man. As the years have gone by, People have come back to us and said that Born Lion is their favorite record, so it's managed to find its way into people's lives. It's Swedish. It's, it's exotic and foreign. It looks awesome. I don't understand what's going on here, but I don't understand, and that's why it's glamorous. In another language, glamorous. Hey, uh, this is the first show on the tour. Our album just got released Monday, so I guess it's safe to say this is our CD release party. Welcome to it. So what's your uh, expectations for this uh, European tour now? Um, I don't know. I mean, the first time we came, we had none as well. Like, we didn't have any expectations, and uh, great things happened from it. So I think uh, I'd like to approach this tour with that kind of frame of mind. We've recorded the record, the record is out. Hopefully people will like it. If they like it, then they'll come to the shows and then hopefully they'll like that as well. Well, in the middle of it, uh, you will going to play Hultsfred for the second year. Yeah, that's actually a gig we're really looking forward to. Uh, good. I hope to catch up with you guys there. Okay, we'll, we'll see you there for sure then. Yeah. Great. Ah, great. Okay. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. We played this very, very memorable show at Holtzfrid. Personal for me because there was things happening off stage that was great and invigorating for me. Why is Holtzfrid so good to you, Dan? Well, that's why I stopped complaining. <laughs> why? Because I see my girlfriend. But Daniel Jones isn't supposed to have a girlfriend. <laughs> oh, what am I? Did I say girlfriend? And at the same time, this show we played at the Hultsford Festival in 2002 in Sweden, it just really 
made me realize that, wow, maybe something's really happening here. <laughs> There were some great milestones on that tour. This is a crazy show right now. I'm going to remember this one. It was not just Sweden. I mean, it was Sweden, Germany, Benelux, Switzerland, Spain, Italy, France. Merci beaucoup, Dr. Bell. How many people here are here for some serious rock and roll? <laughs> and everybody is in luck because this is a rock and roll band. Some serious rock and roll band going up on stage right here. In 2002, we ended up doing the Ozfest and we played it in the UK. Hey! We're doing a little bit of a count. That's a nice, oh, gorgeous. JC will be signing those all day at Ozfest. <laughs> Playing tonight. That day, Ozzy was there. It was great to be there. So here we are doing these like crazy big rock metal festivals. Yeah, I know there's a few other bands here today. And most of them are pretty good. I know you've just been over to listen to a bit of Slayer, and I know you've got something over there. David, our, our drummer here, he got the uh, 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 Slayer pick. Moving up there, when it has one on it stays below the Here's Damon, who actually got the pick, and he's zooming in on the pick. And then going to master Are you going to use that placer when you're playing? No, this is probably one of the last times I'm even, I'm even going to touch it, because I'm going to put it in glass after we get back. <laughs> what are you doing today? Oh, we're going to play a show today. Show These me. Are, that was a hotel. <laughs> is this the PA? <laughs> Wait, where is this it? Or is this the PA? <laughs> Today, And then we come home and we did a tour across Canada. We come dance and play tomorrow as much as we used to and whenever we do. We always pray to God that people show up. I mean, we probably played to more people in one of the smaller European festivals than in three tours in Canada. We were playing these like really bad shows, really poorly attended. It just wasn't happening. And two days before the end of the tour, JC got a call about opening up for the Stones when we get back, the day after we get back. And to make it to this Stones gig, we had to travel all night. No break. And we did it with no sleep. Where's Danko Jones? I don't see. Where the hell are we? Hey, uh, what do you have to say, man? No sleep, because our van broke down in Ottawa. But today we have to play with the Stones, dude. No sleep, because we fucking drove here from North Bay. Once again, no sleep playing these fucking crazy ass shows. Do you love it? Fucking love it. Okay, good night. It was very flattering to just get on the, the bill. That meant that at least one of the Stones had heard of, of us or heard us and approved. And getting approval from the Stones is like you share a joint with the coolest kid in the school or something. It, that, was the, that was how cool it was. But you don't want to say that taking drugs is cool. Okay, well, you get to ride in the coolest kid's car or something, you know, or you get to make out with the head cheerleader or something. That's better. <laughs> For the Rolling Stones gig, we were allowed one guest each, so I asked my dad to come out, you know, <laughs> show him that uh, I, I was in a rock band that's doing something. You know, I could come out to the Rolling Stones. He could tell these people, his friends at work, that, yeah, I went to go see the Rolling Stones. My son opened. <laughs> a couple years later, after this gig, I was in Toronto and I was leaving a restaurant bar and the bouncer at the, the front door stopped me. And he said, I did security for the Stones when they were in town doing the 40 Licks rehearsals. And I just wanted, to, wanted you to know that Ron Wood played Born a Lion 
almost every day. And I was like, holy shit, man, that was pretty cool. Oh, that was pretty cool. To not just play it once and go, fuck these guys. <laughs> to play it, like, during the whole time that they were in town was, wow, well, that was really cool. <laughs> By around May, mid-May of this year, 2003, we went into the studio again in Toronto, this time with Matt as producer. He engineered Born Line. Now he was producing the new record. And the scheduling around that was pretty insane. We had 18 days, right? Yeah. But there was just so many opportunities that we would have had to pass on exactly. if we didn't get this album done now. We've been holding up in a studio, recording an album that will follow before we were supposed to mix it, there was some stuff that needed to be finished, but we had dates already booked that we had to go play. So we had to go play the shows, go back in the studio, finish recording, then go back on the road. It's such a rush to play those songs for the first time in front of everybody after they've been laid down on tape. And I guess Sweden, Sweden Rock, you heard it here first. And then we mixed it and finished the recording of it in a studio called Polar Studios in Stockholm. Polar Studios used to be the studio owned by ABBA, and In Through the Outdoor by Led Zeppelin was recorded there. You guys were peeking on the fact that there's, you know, like a lot of ABBA things in the studio, a lot of Zeppelin yeah, things yeah. and stuff All like that. Stuff. And, well, so was I, but I wasn't gonna <laughs> let you guys in on it. I just was like, yeah, this is how we roll, man. <laughs> this is how it is over here. Came up with a title on the last tour when I lost my voice on tour. We've been playing pretty much straight for about eight months, and after a while, it really got to me. And that's when I just, I just came up with this line one day. We sweat blood. And I'd say it on stage, and I'd dare anybody to take me to the hospital because I was just about to. I thought I was just about to go. We gotta do some more shows on this tour. Unless this is a show that takes me to the hospital. I know no one else in the crew wants to see that, but uh, hey, let's take a chance. Being on the road and just having good times and bad times, it's all what We Sweat Blood is about. I meant to never stop it, it's making no sense. But I can never sit still, I keep on riding. And while you're fast asleep, I'm working all night. Well, I can never sleep either. It's not as if I'm sharing a bus full of, like, Ford models. Like, they're all on top of me. Oh, boy, oh, no, if I see her in her underwear again. <laughs> it's just a bunch that, of fucking being... dudes <laughs> getting drunk and smelling and farting. Am I the only one just completely sober? Yes, can't you tell by only how only grating and irritating Absolutely, you're completely, 100% cold sober here? Yeah, you're in fucking Holland. I'm in Holland. Holland. Yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Do you want some booze? Matt's no, got a mix. Use. Your nerves are fuck. You're on edge, man. I am. Fuck. Close the door. I'm downloading porn. <laughs> Doing We Sweat Blood, I was thinking all the songs were great. Like, I loved some of the songs were heavier than Born a Lion. They were like, yeah. it was it was more rock and roll. I fucking love this song. Hot shot, walking up and down the block. I like it how a minister keeps calling up. The first song off the record, Forget My Name, is pretty much singing about a girl walking down the street, a la the movie Molina with Monica Bellucci. There's a scene in that movie where she's just walking down the street and everybody's staring at her. That scene really inspired that song. So it's just a different approach to an age-old scenario. A girl walks down the street. It's just a similar take on girls walking down the street and watching them. It's a theme I seem to like a lot. This next song is about a girl. Go figure. This song is not about a girl, it's about a woman. This song's about me. This is a song about oral sex. More specifically, going down on a woman for seven hours straight. This next song is about fucking girls 
and shit. If you look at the development curve of my lyrics, it's one flat line. I've always written about the same stuff, and I always will. This one's about rock and sex. Very consistent message. <laughs> We'll leave the, the saving of the world to people like Bono, and we'll leave the rocking and talking about girls and rock and roll and wanting to give people the finger to people like Lemmy and Vince Neil and myself. What do you want to hear? War in Iraq and global warming? This song is about believing in yourself and never giving up hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you wanna hear? <laughs> Basically, after we swept blind, the touring was just nonstop. And we just went on tour forever. And that was it. <laughs> the story ends. And then that was, yeah, that's it. Bonjour, Perry. Hurricane. No less. We wanna thank everybody here at Rock Victor for making us feel at home today. Is this Glasgow here tonight? Is this Gothenburg Rock City today? I know this is the Fuji Rock Festival, but right now, it's the Danko Jones Show. Danko Jones, 2003, we sweat blood all over your face. Next thing you know it, we're like, well, it's time to go into the studio. And without even having proper songs together, then we just booked time with Matt DiMatteo. Again, he was at the helm of doing Sleep is the Enemy. Doing We Sweat Blood and Sleep is the Enemy especially, I remember having almost nervous breakdowns because we were so unprepared. And I didn't think we could match what we had done in Born a Lion. Fuck, fuck, fuck. We had this habit of going into the studio not as prepared as we should have been because there was tours that were booked and things we had to do and we still had to deliver an album and we'd go in with you with like, you know, six or seven songs and have to... And then a bunch of riffs, of course. Yeah, a bunch of riffs always, but pull some songs out of our ass. And that was a finger was a, a song that... So you pulled the finger out of your ass. I pulled the finger out of my ass. The main riff of the finger used to be a Violent Brothers, my old band, the Violent Brothers. Awesome. Riff. We kind of sped it up, changed the lyrics, changed everything about it. And the only thing that remains is that main riff. da na 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 That was the only thing that we brought over to Sleep is the Enemy, but still, it was just because I couldn't come up with anything in time. Damon recorded Sleep is the Enemy with us. As it was about to be released, he quit on the band. The relationship with Damon at that point just became turbulent. <laughs> and, uh, uh, on the road, life was not pleasant, so it was time for a change. And for the tour that would follow Sleep is the Enemy, we started touring with Dan Cornelius. Say hi to everyone, Dan. Hello, everybody. Do it again. Hello, everybody. Sorry, dude. Oh. I, I, yeah. <laughs> I didn't catch you there. Hello, buddy. There you go. Dan Cornelius, he's a phenomenal drummer and probably the best drummer we've ever had all around in terms of understanding music, liking the music, which from all accounts of our previous uh, stick handlers wasn't always the case. He is the fifth drummer we've ever had. I mean, we've gone through a Spinal Tap array of drummers. Totally forgot this song. <laughs> Yeah. 
out of bed, but you like super chill. And John Jed, get your quick fix in my car. Got a sweet tooth and I'm your chocolate bar. It goes on and on and on and on, on and on and on. And I say, What's this say? All the cameras, cameras get on this guy's, uh, he's got something he's raising up. Danko, I kiss on the first date. So do I, my man, but not dudes. I'll shake your hand, give you a high five, but I won't kiss you, man. Cameras, focus in on the, on the two ladies' shirts. Beautiful. And ladies, so do I. There's another lady on someone else's shoulders. She's got a, what does it say on her, her shirt? I fart on a first date. Sorry, I don't. I hold it in for like two years if we start seeing each other. That's what you're supposed to do. Never let air out in front of a woman. So a whole other cycle started, and it started with us opening for Nickelback across Canada. That was our first few gigs with Dan, is playing these huge hockey arenas. Doing a tour like that, it's pretty comfortable. It's not like the tour that we did in Chicago to San Diego in a van. Dan did come into the band's life when it was a comfortable stage. But still, regardless of that, it was still a busy schedule. We've been going since 10.30 this morning. What time is it now? It's like... Six o'clock. So eight hours, eight, seven and a half. It's cool, no breaks. I've been eating through. <laughs> eating through the interviews. The record's not called 24-hour vacation. And sleep is the enemy. So when we'd be really tired on that tour, we'd be like, well, you lay in the record, sleep is the enemy. There's more of a punk rock influence on here as, as, uh, as opposed to We Sweat Blood, maybe more of a heavy rock to metal influence. So, but it's still Danko Jones, it's still rock and roll, it's still three piece, four on the floor, no bullshit. Can I say bullshit? Can I say fucking bullshit? Four on the floor, three piece, no fucking bullshit rock and roll. We were writing a lot in the early part of 2007. We kind of took some time off to write. And that's what we were doing at our very s slow pace, which is something we're not really used to. And then we went into the studio with Nick Raskelenix in Los Angeles to do what would be Never Too Loud. Never Too Loud, it's our fourth studio album. It's all things rock. For our previous albums, we wanted it a little catchier, we wanted it a little heavier. For this record, we just wanted to encompass all the great things about hard rock that we personally listen to and put it on an album. <laughs> Studio 606 making our new album. This is the control room. Turn around here, and that's who pretty much owns the place. And if you don't recognize him, that's Dave Grohl. We've been working on the record with Nick Raskolinix. He's done three Foo Fighters records, Shadows Fall, Stone Sour, new Rush record. The list is endless. There's our song on the record that's named after the album, Never Too Loud. Don't think for a second that it doesn't bother me, man. Going deaf is a son of a bitch. Originally for that song, I had a whole set of different lyrics. And then the story behind that is Dan was trying to decipher what I was singing. And he said, what are you singing in the chorus? Are you singing never too loud? And I just thought about it instantly and I said, no, I'm not. I'm singing something completely different. But now that you say it, I'm changing it to that. So I rewrote everything just because he, he heard that. Because it's never, it's never too loud. When I'm in the studio and it's time to nail down the vocals, I'm only starting to get wound up. The only way to get it really ramped up to go from zero to 100 in a second is to adorn the studio walls with pictures of naked women. And that's the truth. That's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, an adult model. Her job is to take me there. <laughs> if you listen very carefully, 
you can actually see me looking at the naked photos if you listen hard enough. Cause it don't mean shit. Oh shit. That's not a. Fuck, sorry, dude. I forgot the line. It's okay. One more time. Because it's. Cause it won't mean. This session was probably the hardest on my vocals ever. John Garcia and Pete Stahl do guest vocals on Force for the Trees. There was a part in the song that I just couldn't get. My voice was trailing off. <coughs> Sorry, man. You hit your drink? No, I just, I don't think I hit the notes. Mm -hmm. So Pete Stahl was called in and it was perfect. See the forest for the trees. Pete Stahl was the singer of Scream. He was in Wool and Goat Snake. John Garcia, of course, of Caius and now of Hermano and Unita fame, did some backup vocals on it. Little be too soon to make a man. It was a song that was crying out for his voice. The two of them together on this track. If I could pat ourselves on the back, I'd say it's a pretty phenomenal track. Can't see the forest for the tree. 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 On Sleep is the Enemy, we had John Garcia singing Invisible, and John came out on the Sleep is the Enemy tour in Norway, and he did some shows in Canada. Our good friend, Mr. John. Garcia! We got to play a bunch of different songs from the various bands that he was in as part of our encore. We're gonna double down on uh, a song by uh, Caius. And as well, we played Invisible off uh, Sleep is the Enemy. <laughs> We were growing up, we were listening to Caius, and then all of a sudden to have the voice of Caius mm -hmm. come out on stage with us was quite a thrill. We doubled down with John, so yeah, yeah. it was really good. <laughs> Touring is as hard as people say it is, but it's those moments that keep you going. They're few and far between, but when they happen, it's it's a fucking blast and a half. Hot mix! Are you ready for it? More Are you fucking excited? Because I'm fucking excited! More We did a tour with Motorhead, and when you see Motorhead, and they've been touring for so many years, you just really look up to a band like that for sticking to their guns and doing what they've done for 30 plus years now. You know, it's one thing to tour with Motorhead. It's another thing to tour with Motorhead in England. You know, that's an honor. On this tour, probably the most memorable times is going on stage with Motorhead and singing. Last night it was Killed by Death, and I did Born to Raise Hell a couple of weeks ago, and I've done it six times on this tour already, so it's been awesome. Danko got to sing in Motorhead and Saxon. And Saxon asks you if you want to go on stage with them. I mean, I don't know, just growing up, when I did, <coughs> I go, yeah. Princess of so the Night, I, eh? No, I said, <laughs> Can I play Denim and Leather? Denim and Leather. And Biff was like, well, no, we got this new single we want to work called Live to Rock. I'm like, all right. I don't know why, but my guitar playing is better because I'm playing an official Saxon pick. I got so nervous, and then Biff had to like push me towards the mic to sing the chorus. And then later on that night, I sang Kill by Death with Lemmy. So that night was the last show of the tour with Motorhead and Saxon, and that was amazing. <laughs> A European audience is such a strong thing for us to have that if Europe was an, an option for us, we probably would not have been touring and maybe we'd not be a band now. Raise that flag up. That is why Dango Jones feels at home here. Check that shit out. I'm thinking of putting on some slippers and walking around. Yeah. This flag has our signature here about 10 times, which proves that we have been here before. Time and time again. And as I put this on my back to make a cape, I'm gonna take this cape off because it smells really bad. Simon, if you please, I can't even touch it. Use gloves. Well then, make sure you Purell your hands afterwards.
We're going into the studio very soon. This is the last Canadian date for uh, we don't know when. We mean boo. We didn't take too much time to write Below the Belt, and then we called up Matt DiMatteo again and ended up going back to the studio that we recorded Born a Lion in, but it changed names at that time. Now it's called Rogue Studio, and we went in there and just belted out the record. <laughs> I think that we walked into doing Below the Belt way more prepared than any other record of yeah, ours. Yeah, you guys, you guys had a strong vision on that record. Yeah. Just did the uh, solo for um, uh, The Sore Loser in two takes. And You're awesome, home. dude. Get to go home now. Bye. We would sent you some songs, mm -hmm. and you wrote me back and you said, wow, it sounds great, man. Not really feeling that Cowboy Samba song. <laughs> <laughs> and I had all Was my that full cards, of regret? I had all my cards <laughs> betting on that fucking song that ended up being full of regret. Regrets I had mine Loading nights and a whole lot of wasted time If you see her, won't you tell her for me It's better this way to do a word of all this what Matt was really doing was trying to push you to elevate that but song. But you know, the, uh, and, and that's what I was doing because <laughs> I, I fucking, hey. I was just like, what the fuck? <laughs> but I felt worse about Magic Snake. I like, I, I, I shifted my oh, perspective. Good thing it is. That well, was my second thing, favorite song. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that song. Your snake don't wanna bite. Your snake don't wanna bite. When we're writing the song and the song process, the most important thing is to really make sure that we can reproduce that live. So that's kind of the, the premise of really the writing. Like, how is this going to come out live? How are people going to react to it? When you cry at night, alone and don't know why, there's no one left and I'll be walking on. I really love singing Had Enough. It's my favorite song in the whole set to sing. It's got that Elvis Presley appeal. Yeah, it depends how old you are. I mean, I, like, I, I try to dance it up a bit, but I can't. Exactly. I, don't have the I don't have the voice. Oh, I've had enough. I've referenced all those singers like, you know, Danzig and John Reese in the studio, Elvis. I'm doing a Bon Scott meets Joe Elliott thing. Yeah. You can scream in my ear, but I won't hear a thing. Exactly. That still sounds like Bon Scott. Yeah. How about Joe Elliott? That sounds more like Bon Scott. How about Joe Elliott, though? But if you Staccato ever... staccato you with, like, attitude, man. Like Paul Stanley. <laughs> but if you ever want out... As much as I've talked about how much I love Kiss, I've never felt that we've done our take on an early Kiss song uh, a la Dressed to Kill, Hotter Than Hell era. And so when we wrote Active Volcanoes, that was a real ode and a tip of the hat to old school Kiss. No wasted time with a girl that fine. Do what you need to do to get love in. Just keep your cool, tell yourself it's not fair. There's one song off our last record again called I Think Bad Thoughts where I reference two Metallica songs and put them in the same line. No remorse, no regret, never happy endings on these dark sets. I got no remorse, no regrets, never happy endings on these dark sets. Which is No Remorse and Damage Incorporated together in one line. But I like that. I like it when uh, I hear a song from a from a band and I go, oh they they have that album. They took it from that song, from that album. That's pretty cool. And the fact that I know that, it makes me feel like we have the same records, you know, in the same record collection. It makes me feel that much closer to the band. I think bad thoughts. Oh, 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 oh,
Oh, hey, how's it going? Uh, you caught me uh, practicing for a shoe. We're about to go on tour with Guns N' Roses, and this is our warm-up secret gig, and we're being called JC and the Sunshine Band tonight. We're at the Bovine Sex Club in uh, Toronto, Canada. GNR crew and entourage just took us all over the world. Going to Russia with Guns N' Roses was pretty cool. We played St. Petersburg first, which was a beautiful city out of all the cities I've been to in Europe. Just for the sheer beauty and architecture, I think St. Petersburg was one of my favorites. We went the following day to Moscow, and it was our second show in Russia, and we're playing Olympic Stadium in Moscow. So you got no are you up? That's a you have nothing to say. To your friends, the night before your birthday. But you gotta put the control of the situation. Not Fendi wants you back without an explanation. We kind of left early during sound checks so we could go to Red Square and be tourists for a little bit. There was a Lenin and a Stalin impersonator, and we gave him some money, so I got my picture taken with a mm, yeah, I remember impersonator. That. So when we got back, the GNR crew were so kind to have put our stuff on stage and had it all wired up and ready for us to sound check. We were late for sound check. That was the only time on the tour we were. The reason why we're here is because two weeks ago, Axl Rose made a phone call to us and said, get your ass over to Russia. And so that's why we're here. So we would like to say Spatsiva Bolshoya to Axel Rose and Guns N' Roses. We've never been here before, but thank you for the warm welcome. This fucking rules. I've got a big fucking boner right now. I remember walking out of the VIP back to the backstage, so I had to walk by Axel, and Axel was, he was doing, he was singing, and then he locked eyes with me, mm -hmm. and he followed me as I walked, <laughs> walked across the stage. Like, I'm like not interested in the show, like there's something more important, <laughs> and I walk backstage, and I'm like, oh, we're fucked. <laughs> we're fucked. <laughs> Towards the end of the cycle of Below the Belt, again, another change in the drum department occurred, and this time very amicably. Dan's tenure in the band came to an end, and we were not gonna audition for a new drummer, but we knew of one guy who, if he came in the band, he would be the guy. Adam Willard came into the picture. He played in The Offspring, in Angels and Airwaves, and Social Distortion, and he used to play in Rocket from the Crypt. We're huge Rocket from the Crypt fans, have been since 91, and we were playing Rock'em Ring in Germany, and Angels were playing on another stage, so I went to their backstage area, and I think we all introduced ourselves to Adam. And then every so often, over the last couple of years, he would always end off an email to me with a joke saying, like, you know, if your drummer ever breaks his arm, if your drummer ever breaks his leg, give me a call, you know, ha ha. When we got Dan in the band, he gave us a call and was like, hey, why don't you ask me to join the band? I thought it was a joke. JC said, fuck it, just email Adam. You keep, you know, talking about these emails, he, these hints he keeps dropping. So I did, I emailed Adam and he wanted to join our band. And that's the, that's it. This is the third show with our new drummer, Mr. Adam Willard. Let's give it up for him. <laughs> Gave himself a little drum beat. Here, I'll do it for you, Adam. I know it probably sounds cliche with getting a new guy in a band. It's like a new breath of life. It's been, um, a reawakening for us and very rejuvenating and refreshing and we're all really having fun again. Kind of like the first couple of tours where you saw footage of us and Damon just having a great time again. It's a different energy with him in the band. It's a different dynamic between the three of us now. When you go on stage and you want to play with the guys on stage with you, as much as you want to play in front of the audience who's watching you, that's when I think it's evident to everybody. I can't hide that kind of enthusiasm. Rule number one, I'm gonna drive you wild. I'm not gonna stop until you're satisfied. 
you're gonna be the envy of all your girlfriends when they find out who you're going out with. At the end of the day, you really have to be excited and you have to love music to do this for a long time. You have to listen to music, you have to live it. I can look at all the musics that I'm into from reggae and hip hop and jazz and at the end of the day, looking back at it and like, no, I nailed it when I was 14. I love hard rock and heavy metal. I love it all, but I love those musics the best. To this day, you can sit in a room and go, hey, did you hear this new band? It still feels like when we were at CHRY, listening to a new band that we hadn't heard of. And, and I think that that excitement is what really should drive music. Mountain is one of the songs that we have that we only play live. We've never recorded it and we've never put it on a record. And part of that stems from the simple fact that we've tried a few times and it's just never been able to match a live version of it. So we've just decided to keep it as something we do live that people have to go see us live to hear it. How many people doing it it was just people that I liked you know and then I started to go well this can go on for 10 minutes let's cut it down to like dead people and then as the years have gone by there's been a lot of people who have died since we started this Mr. Dimebag Daryl Mr. Ronnie James Theo Mr. Solomon Burke Mr. Denny Damore aka Piggy from Boy Bot and the godfather of the blackest of black metals, Mr. James Brown. Because, baby, when you get on top of the mountain, the only place to go is sky high. It's just one of those songs that kind of sums things up in a way, like a song about positive reinforcement and love and rock and roll. That's pretty much it. I got a mantra that I say to myself in the morning, in the afternoon, and I'm gonna tell it to everybody here tonight. This heart gets stronger, this skin gets thicker, this mouth gets louder. This heart gets stronger, this skin gets thicker, this mouth gets louder. This heart gets stronger, this skin gets thicker, this mouth gets louder. This heart gets stronger, this skin gets thicker, this mouth gets louder. This 
I can't remember the moment I started slapping myself. I could 99% be sure that it was probably because we were playing in front of an audience that wasn't really paying too much attention. What started off as like one, two, three times, then I would do it three times for every line. So I would do it nine times a night for that one song. And you do this nine times a night on a 45 day tour, it kind of takes its toll. The retina in my right eye detached in 2006, and I didn't know because it's a very painless thing to go through. I went to see the eye doctor just thinking I'd be out, you know, in an hour, and I ended up spending like the whole week in the hospital and I was going blind. My eye is fucked! This shit is not a fucking costume. I had my eye ripped out. I wear these glasses now because I'm short-sighted in this eye and far-sighted in this eye because I would punch myself and slap myself. So I don't do any of that now. The hunger for us to get on top of the mountain is still there, but you know, I don't know if we'll ever reach it. To feel that you're successful is to kind of give up on really what you want to do. The chase is always better. And as long as there's a path for us to chase it, chase it, that's the important thing. We're both really happy with what we've got, but you got to be honest, we just want to be in a bigger band and sell bigger places and play in front of more people. We want to be the greatest band in the world. We want to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We want to win Grammys. We want to headline stadium tours. We want to you know, meet the president, we want to do all that shit. Every band wants to do that. Anybody that would tell you otherwise that they're not climbing the mountain to success is lying. Or else they would just stay in their bedroom and make their music for themselves. We like it big! But I was looking at the program, this is not the biggest stage of the festival. Hey, get a close-up on my face. Can you guys see this? Fucking festivals, biggest fucking stage next year. The opportunity that I got with these guys to go and see the things that I do was pretty wicked. Whenever I start thinking this job sucks, it's like I go hang out with my friends back home who work nine to five, and when I talk to them, I'm going, you know what, this doesn't really suck that much. <laughs> We love playing shows, we love playing in front of new audiences. And the fact that we can still tour and we can still put out records, especially in the music climate today, we are very aware of how privileged that is now, more so than ever. You know, if I were you, I'd be envying me right about now. My 12-year-old self would be happy that I was just finally able to see the world by just playing music. Hey everyone, we are in uh, Zurich. Welcome to Germany, this is a Reaper Bond. Yeah, playing Hamburg. That's kind of like a childhood dream, really. I know it's cliche, but hard work just always pays off in the end. The longevity and the tenacity of the band is what I'm most proud of. There's so many of my favorite bands that aren't around anymore. They quit and they're doing something else or whatever. And I, I want to keep doing this for as long as I possibly can, physically possibly can. You know, if you say anything, people will believe you if, if you say it with a... With what? The right way. Like, just, just say, give me anything. How about this? Did you know that the middle finger was invented by a Canadian? <laughs> See? It's That's believable. Wicked. That's really... <laughs> it's complete bullshit, but it's believable. You find another pretty boy to turn you on. I'll give you a little flex. Ooh. My eyes on the prize, limited.
Moving to buy. Only in Holland can you get stalled by bicycles. Perhaps I should organize. There's a lot of things that you can only get in Holland. Bicycle. Traffic jam because of bicycles. Unbelievable. Do you know how fucking retarded that sounds? I don't know how to get angry. I mean, I'm standing up. You're sitting down. Another thing. She's gonna kick your ass. Don't look at her. Look at me. Fuck, I need a break. <laughs> I need hey, man, do you want to call back. it quits, man? Are you quitting? Well, I mean, I, I don't want to have a breakdown in front of the camera here, but I really need a fucking break. I mean, I've been here for nine fucking hours, guys. <laughs> Maybe I should tell you what kind of man Dinko Jones is. He's been called Dr. Evening, Mocha Moses. Sometimes he calls himself the Mango Kid. He came from Carmel City, born a lion, a peabone with a smile. He sweats blood in sticky situations, and he always knows who his friends are. His name is Dr. Lee Dorian, and sources say he's done what no one thought possible, a new cloning technique that is, well, basically a carbon copy. We talked with Dr. Dorian's chief science advisor to get more information. So, Mr. Cooley, sir, you might want to come and take a look at this. It's body, but it's memories, it's knowledge. And unlike traditional cloning, the clone starts off not as an infant, but as a full-grown, exact duplicate. I think we're getting screwed. Can this be done with humans? Has it been tried? To answer you simply, no. Of course not. It just wouldn't be ethical. For any price. Bring me the head of that lying sack of shit feet, Lee Dorian. You probably don't know what it was that got them so riled up about Danko and the boys. It was a while back now, but I'll tell you what, I bet you didn't think it was about a science project. Here's the intel we have on your mark. His name is Dr. Lee Dorian. He's a biomechanist and a thief. Dorian seems to think he's above consequence. You boys are gonna show him the error of his ways. I'll get you all the info you need from my contact, Jameson. Let's go to work, boys. This is the location, guys. Mm -hmm. This is the house, all right? This is your entrance point here. You go in and you make it clean. Don't split up. No funny stuff. Don't try to be detectives. I thought we were going to go behind the house here. What are you doing, man? Are you listening to me? What? be the illustrious Danko Jones. I'm flattered that Frank would send someone of your caliber to find me. Gentlemen! Please take care of our guests.
didn't get my message the first time, so let me make it a bit more clear. Go get the doors. to me. Yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What are you telling me? I... Hold on. Frank. Tell I... me it's good news. It didn't happen. Let's go. I think we got a problem. Look, I don't care what you gotta do. Do it. Yeah. So here you go. We're doing everything we can, man. It's not enough. What do you want from me? To try harder. To try a lot harder. Shit, too. All right, scumbag, tell me what I need to know. <laughs> God damn it, tell me what I need to know! So, you make that work? I think I got the perfect one for you. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie to you. These boys are a rough bunch. Don't take any chances. Downtown, brick warehouse, inside the tracks. They'll be the ones running for their lives.
Danko. Now you can make this easy. Or... You can make it fun. For me. Where's Danko? Where is Danko? when Danko survived the attempt on his life. I guess it doesn't help your image when the guy they send to kill the guy for failing to do his job fails at his. Something's been stolen from me, and without it, your friend will only last so long. Help me help him. This is the last bit of your friend that we have, and if we don't complete this process within 24 hours, this clone will die, and all hopes of reanimating him will be lost. This is fucking bullshit. The device that I need back is a small piece of nanotechnology kept in a tiny container. I thought that I'd be able to circumvent the device and reverse engineer the process, but... It was impossible.
in a matter of time, man. I just want to let you know what's coming. I was just on my way to take care of some business. Now, if you please. All right, by all means. Let me get in your way. You know, uh, why don't we get that taillight fixed? Before you get pulled over or something. Have a nice day, fuckers. Great story. You'll have to tell me again in the next life. No. Start dialing. Hey, Mocha. Yeah. We got us a situation here and you might need to come and take care of. We'll be waiting for you.
Time to take it back I got a few regrets of my own 